meeting to order. Um, I'm Kelly Robinson, chair of the Residential Housing Committee. And as is our custom, we're going to go around the room and introduce each other. Um, this is a departure from our normal custom, is that this particular meeting is being filmed. So um, be cognizant in the back. Um, again, Kelly Robinson, I am vice chairman of the board of commissioners, chair of this committee, and I'm going to go around the room. Start with the county administrator. Uh, Mark Teal, county administrator. Johanna Walnut, clerk of the planning and zone board. Ron Roberts, planning and zone manager. James Worthington, development services director. Brian Keel, water and sewer authority. Travis McDonald, assistant county engineer. Gil Strauss, also with the water and sewer authority. Ramona Jackson Jones, the vice chairman of the housing committee and then also the chairman of the board of commissioners. Amy McCoy, president of the West Georgia Board of Realtors and owner of my hometown realty group. Welcome, welcome everybody. James Worthington is, going, is our executive director who runs our committee. So James, we've got a pretty full agenda. Let's keep this tight and let's hit it off. All right, um, next thing on the agenda is approval of the previous minutes. Okay. Uh, the June 19th. For June 18th, all right, do we have a motion? Hopefully everybody has read the meeting minutes that were published. Thank you so much from last time our meeting. Um, do I have a motion to adopt and approve the meeting minutes as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries. Continue on. Uh, next thing, we'll do a quick update on the, what we've so lovingly named the Pike Farm subdivisions. So. Yes. <laughs> All right. Is that, is that yeah, the take, yeah, Pike Farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming in a minute, I think. Okay. So we'll let uh, WSI give us an update on that. All right. All right. Uh, we continue to make progress on the eight subdivisions covered by our intergovernmental agreement between WSA and the Board of Commissioners. Um, the work in the Beulah Ridge, Palmer Falls, Winchester Farms, Covered Ridge, and Groovers Lake subdivisions are all complete. Work in the Holly Springs subdivision is complete, except for uh, there are two pipes that uh, discharge from two detention ponds in that subdivision that we're going to be lining. We expect that to be complete next week. Uh, Grove Park is currently under construction. We expect we'll probably be in there for another six weeks or so to finish that one up. That leaves only Polk Place subdivision. We have plans ready to go out to bid on that subdivision. It's large enough we're going to contract it. However, in uh, discussions that we've had with the, uh, the engineer on that subdivision, we understand that they are not making much progress getting access to sewer in that subdivision, and we don't have, at this point, assurances that the subdivision is going to develop as they currently plan. So we're, we're putting the brakes on this one until we can get some assurance from the developer that they do, in fact, have access to sewer. They have resolved that issue. Um, we, we don't feel that um, putting a few hundred thousand dollars worth of public funds into a project that may or may not go forward is, um, is wise at this point. So we're just asking them to provide us some assurance that, that they are ready to move forward. That is the eight pipe farm subdivisions. If, if it would please the board, I can also give a brief update on Legacy Park. Um, that one we, we have worked through the vast majority of infrastructure issues. There is still an outstanding issue with some of the sewer line that the developer wishes to dedicate to WSA as public. Um, that sewer line is currently under water due to some issues with their detention pond. We have advised them that that needs to be addressed before we can accept that sewer as public. Um, they do also still owe us a, a maintenance bond on the infrastructure that they're wishing to dedicate to us, but uh, once those items are worked out, we will be in a position to accept that infrastructure. Concurrently with the contractor working to address these issues, we have reviewed and essentially gotten to the point of approval their development plans. So once they address the remaining infrastructure issues and we accept it, they'll be able to move immediately forward with development of the 40 single family residential lots. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tackle both of them at the same time, two different topics, um, the pipe bombs as well as the legacy. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take legacy real quick. So uh, while you're right at the door to development, um, approval of their development plans, what is the likelihood that they're going to be able to address the potential on issues and everything else? I mean, that's completely up to them. Um, quite frankly, they've been moving at a much slower pace than we anticipated. Right. Um, we've been working with them for, I'm going to say, maybe six months now to try to get the, the infrastructure issues addressed. We have advised them what needs to happen, and um, they're, they're kind of driving the timetable at this point. Mm -hmm. 
So there's nothing on our side, development services side, um, water sewer side that can sort of help enable this? Any further, any faster? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I think the ball's just coming in there toward on this portion. Right. So it's a private sector matter. Right. Is it a funding issue? I mean, what, what do you perceive the issue is? Because it's sort of like, hurry up, go, hurry up, go, hurry up, go. Uh, I'm honestly not sure, Commissioner. I, I know, you know, earlier this year they were go, 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 we got to go, we got to go. And right. since we've given them what we're calling the punch list, here's what has to be addressed, um, they have not been moving as urgently as we expected that they would. Um, we're, you know, we've been advising them, meeting with them out on site, you know, showing them this is what you need to fix. Um, I, I don't know what else we can do to encourage them to forward their time frame, but it, it is, you know, from our perspective, it's in their court. And we're going to get into this a little bit later after our guest speaker's um, 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 presentation because, again, we're targeting, um, this is senior housing. R remind me of what the characteristic of who we're targeting, James. Do you remember? It's age target. Age target. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So implied what? <coughs> uh, 55 and up without being legally 55 and up. Right? All right. Got it. And, 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 and so we, we, <laughs> we acknowledge perhaps that there is a need uh, for this type of um, housing options. I was at a meeting this past weekend, and I was um, just giving a brief update and asked a group of people, um, you know, um, do you think that we need more housing here? And the answer was, I was leading them to that point, but I said, what type of housing? And you heard sort of a, uh, at least a consensus to say <coughs> housing is necessary. Mm -hmm. And so while I get we're doing our jobs up to the line, it's, you know, Madam Chair, one thing is like, okay, how do we, how do we stimulate the, you know, the, the local market? Again, there's only so much we can do. They've got to do their part. You know, private sector always has to do their part. But uh, again, um, we've shown at least a best effort to try to get this going and, so, and, and to fill a need in the community. So, um, but thank you for that. Now, I'm going to shift gears real quick back up to the pipe farms. Uh, real quick, why do we do this anyway? And again, this is for the record, so I need to give the, you got me the story. So the back story is there were a number of subdivisions, eight or nine at the time, with around 400 lots that were stagnant in throughout the county, been sitting for several years, up to 10 plus years. Um, there was some code changes on the WSA about requiring concrete pipe in the right of way or outside the right of way. Um, it kind of created a little bit of a hardship or potentially a delay for development. Um, and the purpose behind this was to kind of overcome that obstacle as a government to to get the ball rolling back, to get development spurred. And while I'm at it, I'll touch on that uh, Beulah Ridge is one of those subdivisions and they have actually gotten all of their permits for that subdivision since the five tournament. So that's mm -hmm. probably the progress. That's great. Mm -hmm. so, so we're moving along. You mentioned Palmer Falls. Did you, did you say Palmer Falls? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. All right. I think I thought I heard you say that. All right. So, like, so to that point, I mean, so go back. And this is, um, but still, why do we do this? And this, this was sort of, I think, the dawn of a, uh, a new relationship between you know, the county and, and and our partners like WSA. Um, working on this was important because um, here we sat but this time last year. I remember I was doing my HOA boot camp, and we first unveiled this. And I think. Ron, and, or, or you were there, and what we what we realized was that as we had just come out like Madam Chair, the digest is down a little bit, but it's down because we got these pipe farms, that these these communities that are just sitting there dragging on the digest. So go back to the bigger picture. We got to drag on the digest. There's a cat on the line, right? We came in. What did we come in about one seven? I think we I think um, between me and the director Holman. I think she said one five mark, and I was like two percent of what, what the doc, what the growth was going to yeah. be. And we came in right about one seven, but we've got these nine hundred homes, give or take these nine hundred opportunities, that perhaps could have sort of trickled that up. So it was how do we get this unstuck? Recognizing the rest of the Metro Atlanta area, especially to the north, all their pipes were gone. Those incomplete communities were gone. They were doing new growth, and again, we know we were last in, last out. We know we were the you know. Number one in four schools, number one in distress. So you, 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 you know all this. Um, number two in the region as it relates to, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, unemployment, fourth in the nation in bankruptcy. So we know exactly 10 years ago, what, 2009, 2000, a decade ago, we knew where we are. So here we are, fast forward a decade later, it's taken us a decade to get out of this. 
but we could not have done this without um, our partners. And so, Gil, I, 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 I really appreciate you guys helping us work through this. This is, I mean, how we approach this is something that the public would never quite get. How we had to work through the, the, these issues and how do we collaborate and how do we come up with an agreement and how we fund this thing. And so I also give uh, Commissioner Moe here, um, who's our prior third district, was also involved in that initially, Madam Chair, helping frame this. But Gil, you want to weigh in on this because we could not have done this without you. I mean, I, I really can't add to, to what you said, Commissioner. Um, it was a need in our community and we found out how to fix the need. You know, it was a great partnership, it is a great partnership, another example of a great partnership between Water and Sewer Authority and the county commissioners and, and fix the need and we're seeing that like James said in Beulah Ridge, got the problem fixed, developer did their part, come in and build the houses and we, and we hope to see that in Palmer Falls and, and many of the others that, that have been addressed. Madam Chair, before I shift, any <coughs> comments? Oh, excellent move. We built relationships also with our developers and that's great and the builders so they're just uh, static and we were able to roll up the red tape and roll out the red carpet and that, that happens because of competing all over the Georgia area. We didn't want to be last, we want to be first again, second, there's no room for second place and you all proved it once again. We just, in our customer service, I had an issue this month, or should I say my column was about customer service and that is just key. That's how things move forward. So we sometimes, we have to give a little bit to move, but we gave and guess what? Just we have a nice return on our investment and it also, will uh, certainly have a, a positive effect on our digest. So thank you all, yeah. everybody, for working well, as a team. It, it, you mentioned a good point, Mr. Chair. If I look around the room, this is the same, almost a subset of the same group that was together with those developers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, including mm -hmm. our guest speaker, and, and so, uh, which is when I had a chance to really meet her. And so here we are, basically a year later or so, um, but with, even then, listening to both our citizens, but also our commercial <coughs> citizens, that were like, don't forget about us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, this county was built on that small to medium sized developer and they, they've gone the way. And I think that, that responsiveness was key that everybody can eat. It doesn't just have to be the big national builders and big national guys that come in who can, they, they can do it anyway. It was making it easier for our small guys to get a piece of something that they helped create um, that wasn't quite complete, but we allowed them to finish their assignment. So, again, thank you all, all. I appreciate it. Chase, let's keep moving. All right, uh, next we have. Uh, New discussion items, and yep. as you know, we've invited the 2019 president of West Georgia Board of Realtors. Yes, Amy McCoy. Amy McCoy. She's going to enlighten us. So I do. Um, so I take it now we don't have the. <laughs> you had no luck with that, right? No. Okay, and okay. I had such pretty it's on slides. The and everything. yesterday, and I asked him working on it. So. Okay. So my apologies for that. I didn't know it wasn't going to work. No problem. Not all the slides that were on there are in the packets. However, for the majority of you guys, as you'll be able to look through, I was able to get with Metro Study. Yep. Um, I do yep. have a subscription with them. Good. Um, and so I took, um, I also included the Georgia Association of Realtors Housing Report for August mm -hmm. in there as well. So that way you could see where we stand as a state. Mm -hmm. um, but also I did a breakdown of subdivisions per district as well. So that way you can see which subdivision in each district, where they're at on lots being built out, as well as uh, what's currently active in there as well. So, all right, so, um, since there are no slides, okay. Did so you want me to, want me to take sorry. your, and go print uh, your presentation out? Give her. Yeah, I'm okay. It's more of um, the most of the slides are going to be more of the national slides, um, which there's only like two or three that are on there. Okay, that would be great. Then it is the uh, housing market one. No, we're okay. Okay. We're yeah, we're proper sure. Absolutely. Some of the information you shared at the new te teachers conference was very optimistic yes. news. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, I can. I can do. Uh, if it pleases you, we're just going to give you your full time. We're going to shift gears while he brings that prepare Perfect. this. Okay. We'll, we'll give it back to you. That's okay. Uh, so yes. no, okay. that's perfect. All right. Jane. All right. So while we're waiting, I'll I'll touch on. I'm going to do a quick little um, update on our quarterly reports. Sure. And again, yep. I was planning on it being on the big board up here, but we were able to print some out. Yep. Yep. They are much smaller than. They should be, but we will. <laughs> 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 it wasn't the intent to be on this paper, so I apologize. But. All 
Uh, so I'll go through this real quick and, and kind of give some ideas, some trends um, of kind of where the county's heading as far as um, developments, permits, construction, etc. Uh, if you want to, if you can see it, to the far right, the column goes all the way back to 2008, and then at each column as you work to the left is the, the uh, next year on, all the way up to 2019. Mm -hmm. The 2019 is a running total of the next four columns over, which is each quarter. Obviously, there's nothing in the fourth quarter yet that, that I've got listed. Um, I do these at the end of each quarter. So okay. I'll be going through some of the numbers for the totals and comparing them to previous years and just talking what kind of trends we're looking at. So I'm not going to hit every one of the um, measures because they're broken down pretty extensively. But some of the main things that we want to look at um, the typical most common kind of rule of thumb measure is building permits. Everybody wants to know how you're doing on building permits. Um, that's about midways down the page. Um, so building permits this year so far, uh, we've done 151. Um, well, uh, sorry, I read the wrong one. We've done 143 building permits. So we're on track to do around 200 assuming things don't change. The pace seems to be improving a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking we'll be over the 200 mark. Last year, you can see we did 228. Previous year, 202, 228 the year before that. And then from 2015 back, the numbers were much lower, 186, 157, 170, 131, 65, 57. Mm -hmm. So we're in a much better place than we were a decade ago. Um, still with room to grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, another indicator of progress, land disturbance permits, um, showing 14 for this year. And again, we would be on track for around 20. Um, that is kind of on par with the last few years. And again, same trends. It's better than it was 10 years ago. These are typically going to be um, either large new commercial developments or new subdivisions can be included in some of this. So, um, Some of the other ones that are interesting to look at, um, we'll do business license. We went through business license and they're confusing to look at because of the way the renewals work. Uh, I want to point this out because this has came up many times. We showed delinquents at the end of each quarter. And those numbers can vary a lot, but that we show them delinquent based on when they are supposed to renew. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon to have a lot of delinquencies early in the year. That's when they were due at the end of the year. People hadn't quite got it done. So, but the, the total number of uh, business licenses, sorry, this is small right? Well, look at this. <laughs> I don't want to be swiping. I'll zoom in up here. I can't help them y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the renewals, you can see the renewals. Um, if you skip past this year, because there'll be another quarter of renewals, the renewals are up. Um, typically, we're running about 3,000, close to 3,000 total business licenses in the county. Um, that number's held. It's increased some. It's relatively steady. Um, another interesting one is the number of code enforcement cases. I know I get a lot of discussion with commissioners on various code enforcement. Uh, the total number of cases investigated. Uh, this year already we're at nearly 1,600 cases. Um, typically, so last year we had 1,570 total. Previous year was 1,772. Uh, and then it drops back to around 1,000 several years back. So. Our cases are increasing that we're able to accommodate. Mm -hmm. um, we are proactive at this point only. Um, we're not, I mean, we're reactive, I apologize. At this point, we don't really have the, the staff to go just looking for problems. It's as but the, they're proactive when they're told to be proactive. True. Mm -hmm. And we, we do sweeps of areas as needed, as requested. You know, so we, we'll do corridors and like we did Bankhead, we did Chapel Hill, we did other areas where where we focus on one area and, and try to get it cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, how many staff members do you have? 
There's four. Okay, so yes, four staff members did. I guess it's a, it's a quadrant of the county, basically. It, they third it up, and then the chief officer kind of oversees everything. Handles a lot of the paperwork. He does when we do sweeps and target areas. Yep. He tends to be the man on that. All right, gotcha. So with the sweep, so high density areas is pretty much what you're concentrating in, like. It separate commercial versus residential, or does it matter? How do you approach that? It doesn't really matter when it comes to the, the sweeps. So we've we've targeted particular corridors yep. in sweeps. We've targeted particular residential areas in the past. Um, mm -hmm. If there's an area that has received a number of complaints, either in our office or a number with one of the commissioners, um, that's kind of how we focus those sweeps. So, all right, so we make sure you understand we target certain areas, you know, sort of code enforcement, and again, it's, it's total separation from police, but, you know, right. nobody wants to be police, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, and I know that's not what we're saying, but as you say, you're targeting certain communities, but are we targeting, does everybody get a look? Or are we only looking at, you see what I'm saying, that's what happens sometimes with policing, uh, where we, we just choose only to focus on this one area that perhaps maybe had an issue, and now that becomes the profile. How, how, how do you balance that? So everybody, Countywide is available. Anyone complains, we we approach it. Um, on these targeted sweeps or whatever, the we've done like I use. Well, Chapel Hill was a good example. So we just started on the bottom end of Chapel Hill and worked our way up. We, they hit every parcel that from until we hit the city limits. And we were working with the city. Right, worked with the city in some of those areas. Bankhead Highway. They started on the um, Austell border. Yes. Started working this away. That one's not done, and that'll take a long time. But there are it's a, a huge number of parcels along Bankhead. There's a huge number of violations along Bankhead. Right. Is it because it, it's, it's aged in comparison right. to other parts um, because of its density? Because I, I look at that as a different. It has a totally different character area than perhaps Fairbrook or Chapel Hill. Um, go ahead. I can, uh, just sure. like as, a, as a business owner um, and as a resident of the county. Um, I've contacted code enforcement a time or two um, just because where my office is located, even though my office is commercial, I have residential along the side of me. Um, and so it was hard because I sat with, um, I had to deal with my neighboring properties. Like one, I think, has their own version of this camp in their backyard. And then the other one was doing renovations for over a year. And it was just the amount of rats that were coming towards my office because of all the debris that had sat there for almost a year. And when I did was able when I was able to get code enforcement out, they would only step into my office. And because I wasn't there as the owner of the office, they said, sorry, I can't look in the neighbor's yard because, you know, we have to you have to come and sign a waiver and do all that ahead of time. As a business owner, I don't have the time to keep running back and forth to come write a formal complaint and fight, get a notarized waiver submitted to be able to get things happening. So it was just me having to have chastising moments with my neighbor, like you really need to get this cleaned up, the amount of cost in having to combat rodents and things like that who have just overpowered my storage unit between signs, appliances, and when you have appliances inside a storage unit that's electrical, stuff that now are being ate up by the wires, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I would personally, I would love to see some little bit more on, on the code. I mean, I'm happy to hear that we're doing all around the counties, but as someone who is in close to that Veterans Memorial area, I'm off South, South Sweetwater, you know, it's it makes it hard for those that are trying to have an actual commercial business next to residential and have to deal with those type of situations and then you just never know when they start burning stuff what they're actually burning um, you know sometimes it just gets worse <laughs> so I'll give you a little background on that most of those requirements stem from the, the court system because mm -hmm. a good portion of these cases end up in court and everything just like any other court case you know, every I has to be dotted and T has mm -hmm. to be crossed and there's a lot of limitations on county employees as to what we can see or not see. Mm -hmm. um, generally, now we're, we're counting right away only, like you need to be on the right, need to be able to see it from the right way, because we've been challenged in court over 
every time really through the years. But um, so the basis for that, and I agree, it's frustrating. Um, but there's reasoning behind it that some things that seem so obvious, well, we should be able to do this, it don't hold up in court. And then we end up getting chastised in court. Why do it like this? You're wasting court time. You know, it's not. So we're following strict set of rules and trying to achieve the same thing we are. So gotcha. um, I'm certainly open to trying to figure something else out. Work uh, with her. Yeah, yeah. take I mean, that one offline and work with that. Work something else yes. out. But okay. Please yeah. respond. Thank you. All right, James, I'm going to keep us on task. So just, uh, just, and again, we appreciate this, and this was a, a filler item for, for, for development. In, in, all right, we've got the Thornton Road area that we see is coming online. How much, how, Mark, do you know how many square feet is coming online up in Thornton? With those commercial buildings, from for the sake of the comments. Yes, yes, yes. Um, roughly 2.5 million of warehouse space. That right. sounds reasonable. Two point million square feet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot. That's your yeah, technical no, answer no, there. No, no, <laughs> and we anticipate that coming on. Like now we're, we're we're what maybe a million of that or so is perhaps switch. Yes. Um, the current phase of switches, I'm going to put small in That's quotes. Right. Yeah. I think it's two or three hundred thousand, but yeah, they're already building. starting on a second phase, which I understand will be a larger building, maybe three to four hundred thousand. The um, the stitch fix building, what we knew as a Prologis, they were the developer. That's just under a million. Yep. Prologis is currently under construction on Douglas Hill yep. Road on a just over one million square footer. Uh, so just those two buildings alone, that's two million square feet. That's two million right. Um, Lincoln, they built a four or five hundred thousand next to Stitch Fix. Um, we've we currently have plans for a T five data center going across Factory Shoals Road from them. I'm not sure how large that one's going to be at this point, but yeah, yeah, I think uh, you know two and a half, maybe even upwards of three million square feet soon to uh, Rock soon to come. Rockefeller is there too. That's true. Rockefeller, there are two buildings. Um, right. And then uh, there's, a, there's one going across the street from the second pro now. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, I, I think it's safe to say we're, we're over three million just in the past, mm -hmm. call it year and a half worth of mm -hmm. development to what's under construction currently. Mm -hmm. So from a commercial development perspective, again, at some point, that it all comes online. In other words, it's, it's, it's producing. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's what I call it. it's taxable. Um, and we're thinking that in your mind, what 2021, all these buildings should be at some point of we're operational ready. Yeah, I think that's a safe bet. James, yeah. oh. it's a lot coming online. I mean, it's that's a trend we're seeing out in that area, and it's continued for. A number of years. Um, okay. It doesn't seem to be slowed down. That, that's a hot area. They so. pop to pop. Okay. And again, we're framing. We're going to get into housing here. And I was just, you know, our commercial is primarily there. Are there any? And again, this would be a perfect segue. Um, is there anything else that we're uh, throughout the county? Just again, for the record, before we transition this back to uh, Madam McCoy, is there anything else that's happening in the county? You guys want to go on record? Uh, I'll say long term, we're looking at how that area has, has developed as a industrial warehouse, data warehouse corridor. Long term, we're looking at options between um, Douglasville and Villarica out for Bankhead Highway corridor. Now, there's going to be plans and things that have to be done, but long term, we're looking at what our options are in that region to see, you know, a, can we steer this in a particular direction that benefits the county? So, but you guys bring up a good point. This is where we, and, and I appreciate them chair even establishing this, this this committee to help give input to some of our long term capital planning. Again, go back ten years ago, the entire Thorn Road corridor was what light blue from a zoning perspective, right? Mm -hmm. All this number warehouse, just all this is just pre Chris Chris for Humphrey, right? It's just can we think of anything other than truck stops and, and warehouses? And we sort of evolved um, at least the the type of businesses that we're targeting. Um, but at some point, I still challenge that while our core nature, our core characteristic is industrial because it's Camp Creek, it is Thornton, it is a transfer station, it is I-20, I get it. 
But I said, like, we got no class A property. We, 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 so it, we, we, we're trying to shift um, um, the quality of people that come out here. Right? We're, we're, we're trying to shift, um, you know, but, but yet, how do we attract those businesses that are not just the minimum, um, what I want to call living wage level, the 16 to 20 hour level, right? When, when, when can we really attract this, some, some, you know, Price Waterhouse, PWCs or whatever? How do we, how do we attract those type of, 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 of tenants? Uh, for that, for that matter, um, if we don't make that available, and, and again, I know it's private sector; it drives it. And I know that you know economic development. I know you guys are doing all the right things to try to create the atmosphere. Don't get me wrong, but just for the record, I've watched for ten years. It's like, oh, uh, right now we're, we're we're still playing the hand that is pretty much there. We're shifting it just a little bit with these data centers, these seven data centers. I appreciate that. That it, it, it made sense to repurpose. That, that, that zoning model or that zoning approach just slightly. But, but, but look at us that we're, we're forever, um, it's all about trucks. It's all about warehouses, right? So think about our economy is being driven by that, right? Even with the data warehouses, it's primarily low volume of people because again, it's a lot of, lot of square feet, not a lot of employment, right? So we're trying to balance that. So we want people to come out here and live, work, and play, but yet what are our options from a, a workforce development, you know, workforce perspective. And I just still think we, we're lacking class A property. Yeah, yes, we got little pockets and little flex organization, flex buildings and the Meritage and downtown, little block, like, yeah, I gotta know that that's not enough scale to really attract real companies out here. And perhaps some of the things we're doing with the Lee Road will help perhaps get us there. But okay, I'm gonna segue with that, that commentary <laughs> because then that opens us up back to Madam McCoy to come and talk about housing yes. to come alongside that. How about that? All right, awesome. Thank you again for everyone for allowing me to be a part of the meeting this morning. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And so uh, we've got the printed slides. Mm -hmm. So if you'll just kind of follow along with me. Um, a lot of these, again, will be more of the national numbers. Um, and then your other booklet, like I said, I've attached the state numbers um, as well as some of the local numbers to consider. So um, again, I'm a reader, so <laughs> lovely, right? The housing market is influenced by the state of the economy, interest rates, real income, and changes in the size of population, as we are aware, as well as the demand side factors. Housing prices will be determined by the available supply. With periods of rising demand and limited supply, we will see rising housing prices, as we have, uh, rise in rents, and increased risk of homelessness. So those are things I definitely want us to consider as, you know, when we're looking through here. So in looking at what our goal is for Douglas County, and to echo uh, Madam Chairwoman Dr. Ramona Jones, Jackson Jones um, in her state of, of uh, Douglas County, Douglas County is the epitome of majestic transformation and our regional footprint serves diverse people, philosophies uh, and economies that transcend multiple ba municipal boundaries. Our reputation is more than symbolic. We are robust, energetic, and we are competitive. And I could not say that any better. That was a perfect statement to definitely describe Douglas County and why a lot of people have been attracted to Douglas County. Um, the National Association of Realtors has been doing their homework. As you'll be able to see on this slide, what would have been this slide, the National Association has now seen a 1.3% increase in overall sales this time since last year. The National Association has worked hard to influence the federal rate not be increased. So you have been seeing the decline in the federal rates um, so that people could purchase. While serving on the Federal Finance and Housing Policy Committee with the National Association of Realtors, we were able to get VA loans changed to not have pricing limits, and VA eligible borrowers can now purchase multiple homes under their eligibility certificate. So, also, USDA loans are now offered renovation options for rural communities, which is great for, for our more western side of our community specifically. Um, another part of that our committee was able to get is that FHA has also ex has an expansion on condominiums and have increased eligibility for units up to 35%, where previously we were maxed out at 10%. And because of the decline in the market due to the recession, we've seen that on average maybe only 4% of condominiums were even allowing FHA, and that's nationwide. So as we look at how we want to grow Douglas County, 
keep those things in mind. There is a market that's for it, but we may not have those options available here as of right now. So if we focus then into Georgia Association of Realtors who sent me the report, um, the August report, because we're still waiting on September numbers, as the summer draws to a close, multiple opposing factors and trends are competing to define the direction of the real estate market. After the Federal Reserve lowered its benchmark interest rates on July 31st, 30-year mortgage rates continue to decline, approaching all-time lows that has been seen since 2016. Most ex experts agree that these reductions are unlikely to be sufficient relief, relief, at least in the short term for first-time home buyers. The lack of affordability, affordable inventory, and persistent historical high housing prices continue to affect the housing market, leading the lower than expected existing home sales at a national level. New listings increased by 3%, pending sales were up 9.2%. And, but inventory levels shrank 1.5%. As many homeowners refi refinance their homes to take advantage of declining interest rates, consumer confidence in housing was reported to be historically high levels. Even so, as real estate professionals, we continue to monitor the market for signs of continued imba imbalances. Although the inventory of affordable homes at this point remains largely stable, it is stable at historical low levels which may continue to push housing prices even higher and affect potential buyers across the United States. And I think we're already seeing a lot of that starting to impact here in Georgia specifically. When you look at areas north of Atlanta, um, you know, some people can't even afford those. Um, and so you can see through with the state report that Georgia has seen a 2.5% movement on the positive side in uh, closed transactions. So that just shows that we do have a healthy buying market as of right now, which is a great opportunity. And I, and I look at that again, as I made in the previous statement, that north of Atlanta is priced out of, uh, of where most people are able to even afford. So this is a great opportunity for Douglas County to uh, make that shift. So all my lovely slides, <laughs> as you will be able to see, um, before diving into our local numbers, I wanted to share what the average buyer even looks like. Um, there has been a rise in household incomes with successful buyers. With 33% of first-time home buyers, we're approaching 90 months of continued price increases because of low inventory. Mm -hmm. 90 months. 90 months. <laughs> So yes, we are approaching that, that threshold, yes. First time buyers are skipping the ring. So that means 18% of the buyers are single females. 16% are unmarried couples. 10% are single males. And as you can see, based off of one of the slides, oh, you love my uh, Yoda. These may not be the trends you're looking for. Uh, <laughs> But as you can see on that grid there, you can see how much the uh, how much the married couples have declined over the last 30 years, um, going from 75% all the way to 54%. So hence again, you're finding more single people um, that are buying or unmarried couples. So that traditional household has has kind of taken a sidestep, um, and then most have opted for fur babies instead of starting traditional families. Amy, is that because you can either afford kids or afford a house but not both? <laughs> that could be a factor. I mean, you know, when you look at, and I didn't include all the income uh, uh, statistics in here, but when you look at our housing prices do not match the income potential that most of the buyers have. When I was looking at different index levels, um, when you look at affordability, Douglas County, and let me make sure I'm not jumping ahead on most of these, but um, when you look at the rate of pay for someone, our average income is between 65000 to 75000 If you take an average FHA borrower who only has 3.5% down payment, that means their affordability, and again, don't quote me on current interest rates because I'm not a lender, but that puts them about a $200,000 house, maybe two forty, dollars things of that sort, When you, depending on taxes, insurance, their debt to income ratio, those play a major factor. 
So keeping in mind when we're building these new construction, which I'm very excited about, are we move, able to move them or are we just targeting that specific only buyer instead of where we have most of our resales? So I'm going to tap into what some of that looks like. Okay. Douglas County is known as a prosperous business location and destination for culture filled with passionate, energetic people, creating a new, vibrant approach to economic development in the region. Yes, I took that from you as well. <laughs> we are ranked, I mean, if y'all haven't read it, this thing was amazing. <laughs> I wish I could have been there in person. Send her an invoice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are ranked among top 20 best counties to live out of 159 counties in the state of Georgia, and I think that is amazing. Amazing. And I believe one of the strongest reasons of that is our education system. So I think Douglas County has a lot to offer our residents here in this county. We still need to do more, more work in attracting traditional financing options for people across the uh, county and healthier food options. As continued work in including trails, bike paths, we still have a way to go with lighting our communities. Our public safety officers have done a fine job, again in my opinion. Having public transportation, I feel, has been a great benefit for our county, for the new and old businesses that have been there. Let's, let's dive into the numbers. So as you will see in your other packets, um, yes, you'll be able to see that new construction opportunities for Douglas County have been pretty good. In terms of, of start to closing ratio, because we have a large number of vacant lot developed lots in a total of 2,468, our total supply seems high, but reflects we are chopping down, uh, chopping the number down quarter after quarter consistently for the last two years. Sadly, we still have 4,780 future lots still available in Douglas County. Um, we have about a six month supply of vacant completed homes, but not closed, and about eight months on townhomes with the average new construction sales price for single family homes is about $277,759 at 2803 square feet approximately. That building cost is about $100.25 per square foot if we're looking at what the average new construction home is being built All right, at. Six, say that, so that's <coughs> the record. No the problem. That's important. Yeah. With the average new construction sales price being at $277,759, that equates to 2,803 square feet. And price per square foot, that comes out to $100.25 price per square foot on what's being constructed. Slightly higher for townhomes. The average is $258,490 um, at 2,206 square feet, which brings it to about $117 price per square footage. We rank the, when, when they rank the top 25 builders uh, that are building here in Georgia, probably only nine out of those, and again, these numbers are going to be in that, that bigger packlet, packet, only nine of those are featured for in Douglas County. Um, Douglas County, just taking a personal step, um, was great in attracting a lot of the smaller builders, a lot of semi-custom uh, builders that kind of made unique homes great for Douglas County, and I really would love to see more of that come in. We do have a lot of uh, large builders, um, you know, whether you call them track built or whichever, they didn't give that same uniqueness that Douglas County, I think, thrived for uh, before the recession. And after speaking with several uh, sales office and new construction, I'm hearing the comment remark regarding getting through the permit phase and sometimes has become a little stagnant. I know we were just going over permits, so I'm happy to see there's movement, but I think um, from what I'm hearing, uh, there's windows of opportunities for buyers that are able to take on some of these because the lots aren't being released at, at a faster pace. Um, more remarkable part is the resale properties are still trending higher year after year, which is really good. So from October 1st, 2018 to September 30th of 2019, we saw 2,725 resales. This aside from REO and foreclosures, which has a 9.7% value increase with average sales approximately $170,000.
which is significant since two years ago we were only at approximately 150,000 in terms of the resale prices for our communities. Our REO market is decreasing and foreclosures are very low. I think you probably saw in there, um, and now keep in mind I haven't been at the courthouse, but based on the data that Metro Study sent me, we only had 39 true foreclosures over that last year. So in all, Douglas County has saw thus for 3,458 sales transaction between October 1st, 2018 and September 30th of 2019 with 55% of those being done with loans. So if I did a breakdown, and again, you'll have uh, this information in your packet, 29% of the sales were properties under $149,999. 24.9% were between $150,000 to $199,000. 15.3% were from $200,000 to $249,000. 9.8% were homes priced between $250,000 to $299,000. 5.2% were homes built from 300,000 to 349,000. 2.8% 2 were 350,000 to 399,000. Now 2.1% were for 400,000 to 499,000. 0.8% <laughs> were 500,000 to 699,000. 0.3% were properties 700,000 and higher. So as you see, the higher the price point, and it's not trending up that way. Well, it, it, just, mm -hmm. just as a, based on your, your, your bill curve distribution, um, our housing study that we did overlaid that we were missing, what, two to $400,000 price point? Mm -hmm. uh, which means that that's obviously above the first time home buyers um, those homes that are priced at the, uh, the early stage of the pricing um, scale. Uh, and so you've got this group of people who have their first time homes or these uh, lower price homes, and there was no inventory based on our study for the two to 400. Mm -hmm. In other words, we had plenty of like the higher end, but that, that makes people gonna be able to afford that anyway as mm -hmm. a scale. So um, I'm, I'm trying to map what our housing study said and what our current statistics, and it sounds like we're building. Mm -hmm. We're building in that right price point um, but it just sounds like perhaps the inventory is just not available yet, or is it choice? Is it what's being built is not the appetite of the people? So, and that'll go into the next, uh, the next part of that, but you're right on the money with it. Um, when you look at, and as someone who resides in the tributary, you know, you see the mid 200s, but then you, you have the higher price point. So then when you look at what's being built, and I was just showing in there this weekend, a lot of the homes, the new construction, are already above that 300 mark. And, you know, so again, you have people running to go there, um, and then you have some resale, which is helping that resale in there, but they're not able to compete so much with the new construction being a lot of those different factors. So, um, but the trend that I have noticed in there is it's not so much because the biggest neighborhoods, um, which you'll find in your reports, are the tributary, Brookmont, Mirror Lake. They're not these large lot communities. They're the smaller lot communities. Um, people are getting more bang for their buck. Not necessarily do they want the large home as much as they want to have the, the new features, the smart house options, things of that sort. Um, so in my opinion, I would like to see because, well, let me, let me scale back real quick because I want to make sure I hit this point to that point. Um, there was a 9.8% um, rating that was room for um, interpretation because maybe tax records weren't updated at that time from a new construction to be able to determine what those sales were or they were off-market sales, things like that, that had not been recorded yet in the tax records. So um, what we have determined is that the average buyer is looking for three three bedrooms and based on one of the uh, graphs in there we saw that 51% of the home buyers that's what they're looking for 33% um, want two bathrooms right building square footage 23% were between 1500 to 1999 square feet now 20% of the homes 
of, of the sales purchased in Douglas County were under 1499 square feet. So they were under that 1500 mark. Mm -hmm. So when I look at, when I look at, which I've, I've asked about before, about if we were to look at our minimum building square footage at being 1800, as we see that the common type of buyer is happening to be that millennial standard. And as we know, that majority of them are starting to go back into the city of Atlanta. The smaller homes, the ones with the character, yes, they're remodeled, they're smaller footprint on our lots. If we're looking at empty nesters, our uh, seniors, the 55 and up, what is it that they're looking for? If they're downsizing, do they care to have the master on the second floor? As someone who deals with arthritis and knees and back and everything else ailments, mm -hmm. I prefer master on the main which a lot of people are starting to trend towards as baby boomers are retiring. So I think if we're looking at, uh, and but they wanna make sure that there's quality with the home. So if we're looking at who really wants to get out the riding lawnmowers, I don't think that's the trend that we're gonna be seeing over the next decade. Um, and we should probably consider those, lo those smaller lot sizes, also with the smaller homes. Um, we do know that tiny homes is a trend, we don't necessarily have to be the less than a thousand square foot, but if I'm looking at where the majority, the bulk of our resale buyers are, as well as those people introducing into the market, I think if we were, say, in that 14 to 1600 square foot price range, I mean, square, square foot, foot, we might be able to control that affordability factor and att attract more people to stay within our county. We have the new buyers, but then also those that say are retired, they don't want to have to move out the county because there may not be anything available or because they're on fixed income, their affordability factor for that. Um, and then most of them, again, have fur babies. So I think if there was more two-bedroom options, you might have a lot more. I'm sorry, but what is a fur baby? <laughs> Dogs, cats, things of that stuff. <laughs> so, but in your packet, um, in your packet, you'll see the breakdown of district ones, two, three, and four. And again, that's based on your uh, subdivisions, what has been built out, um, and again, what's currently active. Some of the communities that may have started back in 2006 um, may now have started rebuilding again as they sold off lots and redeveloped those. So there is a breakdown per towards the end, um, each county. So yes, you guys have a lot of paperwork to, to look through, um, but I wanted to make sure you was well informed um, as to where you're seeing a lot of movement between the different counties. Um, and so, yeah. It's good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. We're gonna leave room for, 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 for the questions and I'll, and I'll leave. Um, so, uh, could you, first, well done. Thank you. Well, well done, well articulated, um, and I think we've got it, and, and you're right. So, so to the to the committee, uh, again, we, we, we talked about the, there's a, um, a, a housing gap, yeah, two to 400. We talk about um, lot sizes. Um, um, the county administrator mentioned 1,600, was sort of what we're targeting as a recommended shrinking. Uh, we've got that issue. Uh, there's inventory. There's also legislative. I read me um, something that Madam McCoy just mentioned about um, um, quality. And we talked about maybe increasing quality as a means of getting the price up versus the you know, footprint. But then you have legit, um, you have lobbyists um, on the builder side that is pushing to get rid of what standards um, and just have a, a sort of a, a cookie cutter approach to communities. Um, in, in other words, you make it too difficult for us to give options, and I, which I'm, I'm emphatically against um, letting um, builders have that much power to basically dictate the character areas of our communities. I get it. They want to come in, get in, and get out. I'm totally against that, and I know that's something that um, 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 Madam Chair Tiffany Stewart Stanley is taking up as a legislator. I had that on our agenda to continue to fight against that. We, we do not want to allow those builders um, that type of power uh, we, where we have no voice. Uh, where they get to dictate what type of siding we use. In other words, they're trying to get rid of our power to regulate. And I know it's difficult going to each jurisdiction that they get to set the rules, but everybody has their own character areas. And, and, and so for that, you know, guys know how sensitive we are. District 4 is totally different than District 2. And to now to say that we no longer get to, to advocate for our own character areas based on our citizenry, we're giving up too much, too much. So 
That being said, I, I want to talk about home price appreciation. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about sales, sales volume. Yes. Um, home price appreciation. Are we, are we growing? I mean, I know the historical was 4.34% since 1968, since they've been tracking so forth. I know the bubble. But how are we doing it today without digging deep? So I'm it? smiling so hard because yeah. <laughs> Douglas County was really like the only county in the entire state that saw a 16% price value increase last year, which is huge. Because as you had stated earlier, um, the effects that we were coming out of from the recession and how hard it impacted our county as a whole, but then also certain segments of our county, it hurt even worse. Um, so it was a lot to build out from. Um, and the fact that we are now, like you said, top 20%, I mean top 20 in 159 counties really helps our strength um, and it our, builds our momentum. Um, but I do feel that we are, I mean, we're good being that we are seeing that continuous r rate of return um, for our values. Well, again, so we, we, those people who grew up in Douglas mm -hmm. and then those people who migrated in from Cobb and, and Fort Me. from affordability. <laughs> just just yes. from affordability, right? Uh -huh. I mean, that metro area is also, it's skyrocketing, right? I mean, that pure Atlanta proper, right? Changing. The so average people, was about 6% increase overall. All right, so if I look at this, and this is where I'm like, okay, it's been 4.34% over time appreciation in America. We know in Douglas County, our property values dropped 40%. Mm -hmm. It was at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? And, and now we're finally coming back through things such as our pipe farms and just other stimulus, to, we, just to get back to norm. Think about, we, we're just now building out our pipe farms. Mm -hmm. Everybody else in them built out, so they're more normalized. So we've got this, this hyper, like this bubble, 16% is not sustainable. It's nice as a one-time moment, but it's like, ooh, okay, sustain 16, we, we just went through that. Mm -hmm. from, from, from a, a, a great recession, mm -hmm. that anything above double digits from home price, it's not sustainable, right? So in your mind, it sounds like we're just more or less getting back to par. It's like, it's the cleanup. It's like the old people whose values were depressed mm -hmm. uh, existing, and the new ones, it's, it's, it's taking up where it needs to be, um, but it, it sounds like we're going, it's a slow roll. Um, it sounds like we're, we're sort of insulated based on what I just heard you say, which was a lot. But it sounds like we're going to be okay. It we, sounds like we're, we're in a good place. We are. And again, even though we've seen, like I said, 90 months of continuous increase and listening to several economists um, from a national scale, those that have, I've gone to D.C. to hear and those that have come to Georgia to tell us a little bit more skilled. And, you know, we're still more than a year away before another potential, you know, but when we look at if, if we are being proactive in attracting the type of home quality, the type of standards that we want to see our residents migrate to Douglas, Douglas County, I think that's where we, again, have to take that proactive stance and build those type of uh, attributes that they're looking for. If people are trying to go to the new construction, I think then we need to consider those um, those options as far as what we've seen historical data given. Um, I won't go too much in what I've done with other counties, but however, I look at there are there are some incentives I would love to see uh, maybe helping those that maybe that are these older homes, um, maybe potential grants that could help in uh, renovating some of those properties so it's not just relying on these investors coming in that now you have a title seasoning issue. So there's there's a lot of things that could stagnate the the more affordable homes um, that give people more of that power to travel and stuff like that because of cost of homes. But there, I mean, there's just so many different things on what we can do with some of our resales. But, uh, okay. but. I, no, I, I like to invest in the grants. We're going to, hopefully this won't be the, a one-time um, visitation by you. But, but uh, to the committee, any other questions? Madam um, Chair, or James, or before we... I just have one comment. Yes, I just yes, heard uh, several, just, just listening to your uh, dialogue, just, uh, are we, the houses here in Douglas County considered, they're not affordable? Is that what, what we're hearing on the outskirts? And what, if you could give us an example of a county that is affordable. So right now, Clayton County. I, I mean, you know, we are, we are a little bit different scale from Clayton County, um, but when we look at the affordability and what they're doing to attract more of those home buyers to, to transition from rentals to homes. So when I look at the demographics in that community, um, and I see that 58% of the residents within that county are renters, 
you know, when now that I see the way that they are attracting businesses, um, I was able to sit down with their economic development authority uh, two weeks ago trying to help establish a down payment assistance program, not just for first time home buyers, but those looking to even for second homes and things of that sort to help channel some of those grants to go and repair um, some of the things that may have hurt that home from going FHA or things like that it didn't have to necessarily be targeted to down payment assistance. I believe we're just giving money back to a bank. I mean, down payment does not determine the real strength of that person's ability to buy. And again, that's something I'm fighting even on the federal levels. But when we look at affordability and what we have here within our county, um, right now a lot of it is the resales on affordability, on a, more of the affordable homes, but then those are the smaller homes. And then how much does it take to actually renovate those that I feel like we could have a lot more sales if it was you know the cost of renovating some of these weren't as hard as it is in maybe other areas because of the recession I think a lot of this had deferred maintenance from roofs from the flooding that we had almost a decade ago there's just so many different factors that has impeded that where it's attracting more investors versus people being able to spend that money in their house themselves well, I hope sure. I answered that correctly. Well, Perfect. Madam Chair, back to you. She mentioned what, 53%, 58%? And, and, and I'm Clayton. And what was ours in the study, guys? We had a very high number, too. What, 43% of our homeowners were renters? It was in the 40s. Oh, yeah, it was in the 40s. It was, yeah. well, it was high. So yeah. we're not, so again, so while we had this influx of people here, right, and, and so they're, they're not buying, they're right. renting based on the statistics that we have. So. Again, how you convert them? Um, but to your point, I, I think you're you're on point uh, <laughs> in coming up with creative ways to be able to do that. So I want to keep this going because we got to shift here. We got a couple mm -hmm. more items to cover. So James, you had a question for? Uh, it was real quick. So and this rarely happens, but it did happen once recently. So mm -hmm. I had a person that owns a large parcel of raw land, mm -hmm. looking to develop it in the future. What do you want it to be? Mm -hmm. What is? What so, do we need the most? So from what I'm seeing, again, it, it, it really comes back to, as we were saying earlier, the 55 and up target group. When we're looking at the baby boomers that are uh, starting to retire, um, and yes, I still see some of them working even in their 70s and things of that sort. When we look at what is available, when I assisted in helping switches, uh, getting the assemblage done, and a lot of those owners were living in their house for 40 plus years, trying to find another place for them to go to. One, we don't have very many ranches here in this county um, or with Masters on the Main. So when we look at what is affordable for those on the fixed income, you know, what options do we have? A lot of them don't want the acre tracks. So we, again, it goes back into having uh, those uh, active adult communities. I was even just out, put up offer on a property for my parents down in Noonan because they are at least building those. The 55 and up communities in Cobb, they're outrageously priced. You know, so so I think that is a window of opportunity for us here in Douglas County. Um, I would also, you know, like to look into, again, multifamily situations. I think that is a huge opportunity and that gives a lot, still gives a lot to the green space that we love here in Douglas County. And so again, you're putting housing opportunities on a smaller parcel, which then will allow more green space. I think it is something to consider, uh, since not everybody wants to be a homeowner, like a traditional house, the condos do offer a greater space, which I think will lend to that uh, class A commercial opportunity, because now you've got buildings that can go near each other, you know? Very good, perfect. Guys, I'm going to have Thank to you. shift this list. Thank her. Thank you very much. Come on, guys. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much um, for your time and your, your you're going to make what um, can we ask that you make this electronic be available for my other peers? Absolutely. Okay, just so we can share the record. Absolutely. Thank you again. Um, sorry about the. Hey, you came quick with the uh, print gifts. <laughs> I was very happy about that. You, you lost no points on that. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right, so next up on the agenda, um, future meeting topics, suggestions, speakers. Anybody have anything in mind that want to hear, want to see, want to learn about? Well, we, all right, so let's talk about the, the different categories. We now get realtors. Um, we, we talk to lenders. 
Right. Um, who else in your supply chain? Um, what about builders? So builders is someone that is an opportunity for us. Developers, um, industry analysts, but I, mm -hmm. you pretty well covered that. I don't know if you did. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I you got that. So. Uh, and then we also had listed other municipalities, but we've done that offline, gone to other municipalities to see their process and see how they're they're going. Um, we've not had them come in here and do it. So, uh, but to me, builders or a developer, some of that nature would be. A I like your builders, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I think that's next in the, the blue chain. All right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cycle. Um, if you can work, oh. you got some suggestions. They you know the type. I mean, I guess we talk about maybe a, a medium-sized building, a big. I want a national, and I want a local, small. I need sure. a comparison for the record, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about, to make sure we're getting the right input from both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Big guys got one approach to our marketplace, but also want to. Can't we get local? Get those okay, I've got plenty of this of builders right here. Can okay. Choose from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Amy, have you made the builders aware of what uh, the, I guess, the residents or the citizens mm -hmm. or the folks that are looking for houses? Mm -hmm. Have you, their mm -hmm. concerns and what they're looking for, like um, ranch on the main floor, have you shared that with the builders or is that, will that be an opportunity to share? I think it would be a great opportunity to share. We do le uh, uh, keep our, um, real estate meetings open. Um, and so we've always extended that opportunity for builders to be able to come into here for our realtor meetings. Um, it's a great way to share that information and to hear from their uh, point of view, uh, from what they're seeing on a building standpoint. However, when we're looking at what the national builders are doing, mm -hmm. a lot of them just have their floor plans that they're just rolling out. So it, it makes a difference, like I said, originally when we had those semi-customs, more smaller builders that we had that built to Douglas County, I think those will be great to, to yeah. bring back into your community. Yes. You know, but, but, but and we'll close it. we're doing a bit of time. When, in, in hindsight, when I when I moved out here in 1990, and I had a roommate right on Wesley Creekside, uh, right on Scott U, and, and, and a, a good colleague of mine. And you know, you get married and you get your first home, and you know, you move in, uh, I moved into Mount Vernon, and you grew up here, and I've watched this county evolve. Point. So that's been like a 30 year run. It's the life of a mortgage. And I've watched this place law. In the character areas, um, in size, in scope, in density. And what I've noticed in that 30 years, being an adult, you know, I've, I've been an adult here all my entire life, and that we're aging out. Right? And, we're, and I think to your point, there's, there's a combination, I think, um, Madam Coyle brought up a good point. There's a need to accommodate. Me, which is like, well, I got options. I'm not looking, I've lived a traditional married couple life and so forth. I'm going to decide that. Right? There's a lot of those you know, unmarried couples mm -hmm. or, or people, single people who have options. Right? So, so you've got that. But you also got my mother who was looking to downsize her house, looking for some type of senior, like, I haven't done that. I don't want no yard, and you don't want to do the yard. So, okay, so what do we do? So it, it speaks to, whereas we once, when we had these three acre minimums, it was an old idea. We will leave it to our children's children. It's like <laughs> them children children. Like I don't want all that land. <laughs> I, I want a different lifestyle. I want a different live, work, and play right there. You know, Sun Trust Plaza. I just want to be congregated with my friends. I just want to roll differently. So I'm not saying we're going to go to a straight density model. I mean, I'm sure it is something that we got to get this right mm -hmm. for attractiveness sake. And so I think the builders are, are, are going to be important to help shape with those, how do we attract these master plan communities, <coughs> the point you mentioned, the Mirror Lakes, the, the, the Brookmont, the tributaries um, uh, for um, mixed use, uh, mm -hmm. for high density. We've got to get this right, and what we do over the next probably five to ten years will set the tone for the next 30 years. So, uh, on that, Madam Chair, you always get the last word. Anything else? Because oh, I, I think we're to done. Just, just piggyback just a little bit on a yes. couple of things you said uh, in earlier in the dialogue. It was healthy and food options. I just wanted to uh, so we have Instacart, which you can order online. So now, um, guess what? Sprouts is available now, and you can order online. Um, of course, it comes from another county. But um, our rooftops is usually a problem with us getting some of these stores that you want because it's not enough people in Douglas. But now uh, Costco and which Sprouts is year-round uh, telling is available, so you can order those online. And I've been trying to pass that information along to the citizens. And then lighting options, we are working on lighting. Throughout the uh, entire Douglas County, for
uh, interstate access to for all the areas of uh, each district. So that's under that's in progress right now. So I just, just took some copious notes while you speaking. Just want to just so we're back on that. And that's it. Right. Anybody else want to weigh in? One more quick. Yes, yeah, please. Um, it's, we'll I'm related to this, but um, as far as meeting times schedule, it, I, this don't have to be official today, but is everybody okay with keeping this same schedule next year? I'll bring the dates and times to the next meeting to approve, but it's we've been meeting on the morning of the night commission meetings That's fine. every other month. Mm -hmm. If I'm here, I'm here, so I better stack it all up. So okay. I'm fine. So I'll bring those times and dates and I'll yeah. get the quarterly meeting. Yeah. Yes. Are we every month or every other month or quarterly? We've been doing every other. Um, it was talked about going to quarterly. Um, if, See, if the, we want to try that and see if housing is different, it's not operational that you need to monitor monthly. Right. Uh, I think quarterly would be okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Quarterly, very well. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Quarterly. Anything else? That's it for me. Gil, sir, thank, thank you for letting us join you today. Anything? All right, all right one thing, all right, so to your <laughs> point, you mentioned, exactly. you, you, you mentioned the, the Veterans Memorial, I mean, yes, yeah, Veterans Memorial Highway. All right, and so I'm hearing at some point, District 2, the Eastern Wall, the, the, right across the river from Cobb and Fulton, is going to be built out. Right, listen, mm -hmm. listen to what you're saying. I mean, it's only so much pockets of residential master plan I'm going to be able to do. There's only so many pockets of that commercial two lane skirt. I mean, it's going to be built out in five years, for the most part, without those small parcels in December. And in years. But if you talk about going west, what is going to be our approach? I'm not for a real answer, but there's got to be a real conversation um, regarding infrastructure. Right? Um, what is it going to take to be able to realize that we intend to do that? Is the infrastructure there? The reason I say that, this is important, and I'm glad we're filming this. We were fortunate to be blessed by those who had the foresight to lay fiber along Thornton Road for this administration and this generation to be able to realize the switch, the Googles, the t files We had nothing to do with that. Somebody had the foresight in the prior administration, they didn't benefit from it until we realized, oh my God, we got dark fiber here. What the heck is dark fiber? Who did this? Part of leadership is sometimes making decisions that you will never benefit from in your current time. Right, this four and a half billion dollars, five and a half billion dollars that we're benefiting right now, we didn't make a decision to lay that, that infrastructure there. We just realized, oh my God, look, there's oil in those hills. I mean, really, right? You, you, you shot, and it, it, so my, you know where I'm going with this, which is at some point the leadership today has to lay a foundation for the, um, for the future leaders. And so again, as you guys are, um, um, are, 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 as you are messaging that we need to go along the Cap Ferry, down the Veterans Memorial and all those things that are um, obviously east of Chapel Hill, no, west of Chapel Hill, there's going to be a real um, capital investment requirement. And I, I, I'm hopeful that um, the county and the WSA will continue to have a great working relationship to figure out how we're going to go fund all this. And you know where I, I had to do that for the record. So, so to, to, that, to that point, I, I'll, I'll talk about the east side first because I, I think, you know, the dark fiber was a, a, a brilliant idea and you wouldn't have the data center assets that you have out there but you know selfishly i'll speak to water and sewer too had we not invested tens and twenties and thirties of millions of dollars in water infrastructure sewer infrastructure you wouldn't have the development either so so you know we along with our, our county planning groups you know we we don't know what's developing next that's not our job we don't we're not the planners we're not the zoners we're not the you know that group um, but we do have a big play in where do we go next with water and sewer infrastructure you're right the east is building out um, where are we going next and, and this this goes back 10 plus years in community planning the next area for sewer development was the southwest quadrant so you've seen over the last few years now the the propagation of that well that that didn't just happen two years ago that was that was a decade in the making a few years ago we, we started the dialogue what was the next area and, and james just spoke to What's the next area after Southwest? Northwest. So we've started the planning efforts on, on our end, the, the county started the planning efforts on you know, zoning, community development type, type efforts on what, what does that area look like? What do we need to plan for? We've just recently completed our wastewater master plan that includes how do we, how do we go get that, 
that area. So, so you do the planning, then you develop the funding, and then you then you develop the infrastructure where you install the infrastructure. So all, all that's in the works. It just a lot of that happens, you know, behind the scenes. You know, folks folks like James and Ron and Travis and Brian, you know, they're they're working behind the scenes with the the groups like Chris and and others to identify the next areas. What do those look like from a development trend standpoint? And then what infrastructure needs to go support it? You know, we talk about water and sewer. Y'all are talking about roads and you know different types of of things. So that that's the the two-minute discussion on a decade's worth of infrastructure planning. Right. And, and so to that point, we just will leave it on this note, which says that for every um, target area, it's 10 million a pop per group. Right? And, and then it becomes, what becomes the priority? I, I can, I can, it, it's, we're talking about new infrastructure. And it, and it gets real. And it gets like, okay, guys, we, we got a nickel. Work with. How do we fund this, right? Yeah, we don't understand bonds and all that. And you, you get my point. I'm framing this for for the record. This says, okay, we got some serious decisions to make. This says, okay, it's easy to keep. Yeah, District Two, East Side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at some point, gosh, we got to. Well, you don't have to, but I think this group is enlightened enough and smart enough to figure out, like, let's 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 plan right. It's just plan right. I didn't say commit and, and, and strike a check. But we need to plan and, and not be afraid of. It's going to cost what it's going to cost. But at least let's get our minds around it. But on that note, county administrator, anything from you, sir? No, sir. Good. James? <laughs> no, sir. All right. Uh, if all hearts and minds are clear, let this meeting stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.